Hello, everybody, and welcome to Big Blue Kickoff Live, day two at the NFL Combine. It is Wednesday. John Schmelk, Paul Dettino with you, joined by the one and only Paul Schwartz from the New York Post, who is all over Joe Shane yesterday like a bad suit, making sure, <laughs> as as uh, <laughs> Will Clyde Frazier would say. So, Paul, Wait, hold on, hold there. on. Will Clyde Frazier does not have any bad suits. No, but he says... He was all over him like a bad like, suit. I understand that, yes, but yes, no, yes, no, yes. Paul, he, he does not. He no bad suit. That's no, a copyrighted phrase. You now owe him money. Yeah, I gave him credit for the line. <laughs> I didn't steal it. Anyway, so we were listening to Joe Shane yesterday. He was on our show. Then he spoke at the podium. I'm sure fans have seen a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't say a ton, Paul. So we could talk about. He basically said that they're cautiously optimistic about both Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley. He's talked to both of their agents. He's talking to basically all of the yeah. agents of all the pending free agents this week, making progress, very generic stuff, nothing mm-hmm. that I think we could take a ton out of, at least in terms of the free agency part of it. Let's start there. Your takeaway from Joe Shane on where they are with Daniel, Saquon, Julian Love, and everyone else. Well, just for once, I want one of the GMs when you say, "Have you? Um, uh, what about this player? And uh, I want the GM to go up and say, yeah, I, his agent came over to me. I, you know, I shut the door in his face. I'm not talking <laughs> to him, you know. <laughs> right. there's, there's, That's there's, never happened. <laughs> well, it has happened, actually. But no, but that he gonna, wouldn't tell you. Yeah, yeah, no, he would, no. Um, <laughs> would tell you. Y- you know what? You know what? In, 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 it's interesting. In some years, right, I mean, the Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley questions are, are natural. And not only for fans, not only for us, not only for media, um, for financial reasons and for football reasons, they need to know what's going on with these two guys. Now, the Daniel Jones thing is he is going to be their quarterback next year, you know, whenever the first game is uh, taking the sh- – it's funny, Paul. And, by the way, Joe Shane was very clear about that, Yes, too. he said, if we don't get a deal with him, we will tag him, period. Mm-hmm. Now, I guess you could go to the nth degree and say, Daniel's not going to sign the tag and he's not going to – He's going to choose to sit out this year. Okay, let's not go there. But, you know, he's going to be the quarterback. You know, it's funny, Paul. I was going to say, um, look, when the season starts, Daniel Jones will be behind center. I was going to write that. Mm -hmm. And then I said, boy, that's really outdated. So I wrote, uh, when the season starts, Daniel Jones will be back there taking the shotgun snap. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Right? You can't say behind center anymore. That's right. It just doesn't work anymore. Um, Look, I I thought Joe said some things that were interesting. I mean, he is making the point rather dramatically, rather emphatically that if that, that we do not want to tag either of these players, it's not good for them. It's not good for us. And if we have to tag Daniel and he, that, that 32.4 million comes off the cap, the moment they tag him, that it is going to hurt our ability to help the team around Daniel hurt our ability. What they're going to be about 50 million under the cap after the Kenny Galladay release Give is in the books, right? Mm-hmm. So right. I wasn't a math major, but 50 times 32 is what? Well, 18. well, I that, think it's 50 minus subtract. 32. Not yes. Oh, did I say plus? Yes, not yes. multiplication subtract. math major. I was trying to help him out. <laughs> see, see, that's why I can't get the cap right. I put a plus with his own mind. <laughs> yes, <laughs> 50 minus 32 means not a lot of money. All of a sudden they go from no. a team that, that has a lot of cap space, a team that has, you know, marginal cap space. So, um they really need to get something done with Daniel Jones. I think there's a chance they will. Um, I would say at this point, my guesstimate would be 60-40. They come up with a long-term deal by March by um, by March 7th. Do you think 60-40, yes? I think 60-40, yes. Um, What's your sense on how far apart they are at this point? I, I don't think it's – I think it's it's – it's somewhere between significant and manageable. You know, it's not like we're close. I think they're – I think they're in their strange stratosphere, but not the same ballpark. I really do. You know, look, put it this way. 45 is a number that's out there. That's that's not, you know, you can ask for whatever you want. You know, I asked for you guys for 100 bucks to do this appearance. I mean, you know. I'm get- and then we slammed the door in your face. <laughs> and they, right. They, 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 I said, talk to my agent, you know, and my wife didn't pick up the phone when, 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 when you called. Um, so, look, Daniel Jones has every right to look at the landscape and see, I'm worth $40 million. He has every right to think that. He really does. Now, whether the Giants think he does, that's another story. But this is this is the reality of the NFL. 35 is not going to get it done. I just don't think it's going to get it done. You can say, oh, my God, $35 million a year for five years. That's that's generational money. He can never have to work again. Yeah, I know. But if he thinks he can get 38, he should go get for 38. So I think there's going to be a middle ground there, I think. 
Daniel Jones obviously wants to be here. He wants to be the quarterback. And look, Daniel Jones just went through a year, a complete, you like to call it prove it, right? The prove it year. Right. He went through the whole 2022 was an absolute prove it year. The first thing Joe Shane did basically, his first main decision when he came in was saying, I am not signing Daniel to the fifth year option, right? Daniel didn't like that. Daniel was not happy with that. I know that for a fact, but it was the obvious logical thing to do. Yeah, I don't uh, think it was the wrong decision. It was. I don't think anyone thought it was wrong. Now, now, if you could have Daniel for $22 million, that would look really good. But it was not the wrong decision. They did it. I know Daniel, you know, he should not have been happy with it. He said, okay, I'm going to prove it to you. He stayed healthy for every game. Uh, he had a really good year, but he had through 15 touchdown passes. We can talk for two hours about why that number was so low. Some of it is Daniel. A lot of it is not Daniel. But I think when push comes to shove, they will realize that Daniel at 37, 38 million a year for four or five years is a really good deal. And I think they'll take it. Well, if it is 60, 40, that Jones signs the deal, the good news, Paul, is that they can then use the tag on Barkley. <laughs> yeah, but they don't want to do that. You know, you know, they don't want to, you know, you know, but they could, they could, first of all, Saquon is not going to want that. Now, Players don't always get what they want. Here's the thing. If they sign Saquon to a three-year deal, the offer at the bye week was 12 and a half a year. Okay, I know that. That was the offer. So if if they sign him to a – so that deal, if it's three years, also not a math major, 12, 24, 36, 37, or 38 for, for three years, right? right? His first year cap number is going to be around five or six million. Right. That's That's less than 10. Oh, that's what you, everybody would like. That's what everybody that's would like. better for everybody. So, so, you know, does, does, does Saquon want to look at this? You know, Daniel has a lot to lose, obviously. If he goes into next year on the tag, now he's got to stay healthy. He's got to have a good year. Um, look, the team could be better next year and not win nine games and not make the playoffs. You know, all that's going to come into play. Now, Saquon looks at it as a running back with a much higher, you know, degree of, of getting hurt. And, and, and Saquon is going to say, okay, I'll play for the tag. 10 million and then I'm going to you know lead the league in rushing and I'm going to be out of here and I'm going to make 15 million a year. I don't think that's very likely and Saquon needs guaranteed money. He's a running back. They need guaranteed and money. Paul, so I got to be honest with you. It's such a flooded market with running backs. I mean, is someone running to him with more than that in unrestricted well, free agency that's, anyway? That's, that's you know, well, for, as you guys know, you've been around long, not as long as me. You've been around longer than me. Um, you've been around longer than I'm the young guy on this Methuselah. podcast. How you doing? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, George Young used to, you know, he used to call George Young kid, I think, when he first started. Um, uh, but, you know, as, as we all know, sometimes players, they have a lot of pride in them. And I, I'm just talking to Saquon in general. And they say, I'm not taking that from my team. And they'll take it from another team, right? You know, yeah. they do that. They say, I'm not, look, yeah. the Giants are low. That can happen. Me, and that can happen. Then another team offers them a very similar contract. And they say, well, I'll take it because I didn't, you know, I think OC did that to a certain extent. Justin Tuck a little bit to a certain extent. And we love those guys. But, you know, they said, we think we're worth more. This other team gave us a little more. I'm going there, even though, every, you know, they wanted to stay giant. Sometimes they just have to go. Right. How about Julian Love? You know, he was kind of mentioned at the tail end in, in the thing on the side we did with the beat reporters. Uh, your thoughts on how that's going to go, what the safety market looks like, and I think they love Julian Love. Wink Martindale is a big fan. I think Julian Love wants to be back, too. And generally, when that's the case, things tend to work out, I think. Your thoughts on, on how that might look? He wants to be back. The Giants want him back. But look, as Joe Shane said, everything we do is this year, next year, looking ahead down the road. You know what I mean? You know, okay. Dexter, Compete now, prepare for the future. Well, well just, just fin future? financially. Who is going to be up in a year from now? Who is, you know... So they have Xavier McKinney sitting out there, right? Mm -hmm. Now, their plan is to eventually make Xavier McKinney the highest paid safety on the team. That is the plan if he develops as a player. Now, he takes a big hit this year with, with, with his accident and his hand injury. But I think, you know, if you took it, you know, poll all the defensive coaches and Brian Dayball and Joe Shane, say, okay, who do you want to invest in long term? They'd probably say, well, we, we think Xavier is, is the guy who has more right. upside as a safety. So... They can't pay Julian Love as a number one safety now, and then a year from now, Xavier McKinney says, okay, I want to be the highest paid safety in football. You know, you, there's only so much you can give into one position, especially safety position, you know. Um, so if it works, I, you know, Julian Love was, was, was pretty good selling himself after the season. You know, he said, I played through every game. I had to sacrifice. I had to do a lot of things. 
And he mentioned when Xavier got hurt, I had to do a lot of things that maybe weren't in my comfort zone. We led the team in, in, in tackles. So I don't think Julian Love is thinking of himself, I'll come back at number two safety money, and that's fine. I think he thinks he's proved himself. So we'll see how that goes. I mean, I don't think it's a no-brainer that he's back because he wants to be back. And Joe Shane says we love Julian. They do love him. There's nothing not to love about him. Look, the writers gave him, you know, the good guy award, right? He's a he's a pleasure to have in the building. He's a pro. He's a pro. He, he's, he's a class guy. He's a good player. Now, what did George Young used to say? You get in trouble when you pay good players great money. Right. That's what free agency is all about, right? When, when you have to, you know, you need a, a, a receiver, you take Kenny Galladay. You need somebody, you, you sign these guys. Free agency is, the, the, the definition of NFL free agency is playing is paying good players great money. And you can't do that with your own guys. So we'll okay. see. Okay, I'm going to ask you a different question, not about the running backs, the safeties, or the quarterbacks. I'm going to ask you, how will the Giants solve their wide receiver dilemma? They could either go trade, they can go draft, they can go free agency, although I think the, the last uh, is probably not, given the money situation, a very feasible choice. I think the funniest thing and, and the truest thing um, that Joe Shane said, you know, in his meeting was us on the podium and off the podium was asked about receiver. He said, yeah, I know there's an obsession with wide receiver, you know, in, 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 in the fans and with us right. and, and, you know, probably in Brian Dable's private conversations like okay can <laughs> in, kinda... in fairness they've been saying they need to improve the wide receiver spot themselves for, yeah, but, for months. But, and, and 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 joe didn't say look we're fine at wide receiver right he didn't but yes there is an obsession with wide receiver where we're to the point where a lot of fans say at number 25 they have to take a wide receiver right and we know no not right they obviously certainly could take a wide receiver but you know we know i know for a fact they are salivating for inside linebacker help they can't stop the run. And by the way, also for guys that Joe can help Shane. Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams, yeah. who I Joe knew Shane was admitted this. Yeah, he said both things yesterday. Yes. You know, he already admitted this. Yes. So, they know. so, so it, it, they know, right? They, look, they know. Look, he had two words. Two words. What do you think of your depth on the defensive line? Not what did good. Joe? Not. He said not great, right? Right. I think he said not exactly. Great, right? Maybe, not, maybe, not, not great. Not, not great. Okay. Well, Paul they, has the notes over there. They, Paul, what do yeah. you got? Not great. I think it's not I'm looking, great. I'm it looking, was definitely I'm not looking. great. Where was it? Where was it? Yeah. Where was it? Not great. Where was it? Not was great. It? Not great. Yeah, not great. Yes. Not great. Yeah. So, so we know that now it is not great. Meaning they would take a guy at number twenty-five who's a defensive tackle, uh, knowing they have Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams, two of the best and soon to be with Dexter highest-paid players at that position. They could. I mean, a, 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 def a defensive tackle in a rotation can play what? 40% of the snaps, mm -hmm. right? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? At a position of in tremendous need. Look, one of the most underrated injuries last year was Nick Williams. It, it was, absolutely be, it was. It, it turned and, out and, to be. You know, I mean, when he's I... He's a good player. He, he started seven of the first eight games. He is not Aaron Donald. We get that. He was not Dexter Lawrence. We get that. When he went out and they had this, you know, a jamboree of guys trying to, you know, you know, fill in there, their run defense went from bad to worse. Um, well, it, it didn't help that DJ Davidson, the rookie, was hurt. They were hoping that he could give them but some snaps, but, too. But he didn't even play, you know what I mean? So I'm saying, you know, I mean, yes. I mean, you know, Darian Beavers might have been a starting inside linebacker. I think he would have been, by the way. I think he they, I think he could have been, yes. I mean, he would have had to probably play his way out of it, which is amazing. What was he, a sixth-round pick? Mm -hmm. So, But, look, he didn't play. So, you know, uh, yes, that was a plan, but you have to take that plan to the side. You know, I like to analyze the guys who played and then the guys that lost. So as far as the wide receiver position, um, Look, they picked up Isaiah Hodgins, and he became a good player. They re-signed him. Um, they obviously need to add. They will add in the draft a wide receiver. I'm not guaranteeing at number 25. Now, this is not a great wide receiver draft. Nobody no, thinks not. it is. You know, with some of these years, you say, you can get guys in the third round. They can be great players. And people aren't saying that this year. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if they pick one at 25. I wouldn't be shocked if they pick one in the second round. Um, I think they'll pick one up in free agency. You know, they'll pick up somebody who Dave Ball's familiar with. Um, and, and, you know, the odds are quite high that when they start the season next year, WR1 is not a guy who is going to blow your socks off. That just looks like the reality right now. And by the way, final question, Paul. The one thing we didn't mention, I'm not even sure you guys asked him about it yesterday. We even mentioned cornerback. And they were searching for a cornerback, too, all year last year. Guys are in and out. Dory Jackson's also on the last year of his contract now, too, right? So you got to figure cornerback something that they're going to be looking 
at either in free agency or the draft as well. This is the problem with this stuff is that is that I could sit here and talk for an hour making a case. The cornerback position is has to be the number one priority for this team, right? You could you could absolutely make and a case for that. It's a deep draft on corners. It's a better draft on corners. It's a good draft on running backs. Now, you know, don't forget. By the time the draft comes, we're gonna know what's going on with Saquon Barkley, right? Right. All of a sudden, in the second round, you may have to start thinking about a running back or the third round. You know, which which the NFL is littered with running backs in the second and third round mm -hmm. who are Pro Bowl players. So that's not a terrible way to be. But yeah, cornerback. Look, they like Adoree Jackson, and his money is not terrible for a number two corner. You know, that's what the Giants view him as. He is a number two corner. They had James Bradbury, right? We know he's not longer there, so. You could certainly make a case at 25. They pick the best cornerback on their board if they think, you know, they have him rated 15 or 18 or 20, whatever it is. He has absolute need. I mean, I don't think Rick Martindale would, would, would you know, storm the podium if, if, if there's a name of a cornerback there. And he says, no, no, take a wide receiver. We're fine. I think Wink would be fine with that, more than you fine You mean he'll blitz that. the podium? Yes. Yeah, exactly, correct. <laughs> yes. Paul, good stuff, man. All right, thanks. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good Thank to you. see you. Paul Schwartz, New York Post. We'll come back with Mike Renner, the draft guru for Pro Football Focus. Welcome back to Big Blue Kickoff Live right here on Giants.com and the Giants mobile app. Paul Dottino, John Schmelk with you. Joined by Mike Renner, who is the draft master, king, guru. All those. Yeah. Like all that. I always like doing this too. He's the author of the Pro Football Focus Draft Guide. And I'm a dinosaur. So oh, I still print this out. I know Mike always gorgeous. gets a kick out of it whenever I print this out and I show it to him. It this year we put some work in on the on the graphic design. Not me, but no, so no, the, the graphics the, team is the right. presentation is immaculate. Yeah, it really is cool. And by the way, this will be what about twice the size when you're done with it in about a month. Yeah, we're gonna get to 250, so over twice the size. Woo. Yeah, and and honestly, I try to have our guy at the Giants printed for me, and they can't get it into one spiral. Seriously, <laughs> yeah. I, I have one offense, one defense. So that's yeah. how it goes. All right, Mike. Uh, so let's start here, I guess. I guess we got to start the news of the day, right? Yeah. About this Jalen Carter stuff, man. For the fans that haven't heard, there was an earlier report today that uh, he was involved in the car accident that cost the life of one of his teammates in Georgia. Then shortly after that, charges were filed for reckless driving in the case. What's the impact of this here, Mike, as we move forward? Yeah, obviously a pending legal situation. I'm not going to speculate on Another what that's one, exactly going to be, but... I think if you're one of those teams who was banking on him being there in top four, top five, thinking that that's your guy, I just don't see that happening anymore. If all those facts are true, if that's actually the case, I don't see looking your fan base in the eye with a you know number three overall pick, number two overall pick, number four overall pick, and saying the guy who just you know was involved in a tragic accident is the guy we're going to be taking. So uh, it would be difficult to see, but there does become a sort of conversation though. At some point, it is worth the risk to NFL teams because wins still matter. So I think he's going to fall out of the top five, but I do think he's still probably going to be a first rounder if he's not, you know, if the legal situation plays itself out and he's not in jail. <laughs> so the news cycle drops that on us this morning. But prior to coming here to Indianapolis, what did you think the biggest storyline would be coming out of the week? Oof, the biggest storyline, I think it was going to be the quarterbacks uh, in this class. It was going to be Bryce Young's height, and it was going to be Anthony Richardson's just absurd, freakish <laughs> duels. And so I think that's going to be the biggest storyline, and then just who goes one and the trade possibilities of the number one overall pick, which now obviously the Carter news throws somewhat of a wrench into uh, and what the Bears would want to do because obviously that's the guy they would have targeted should they have stayed at, you know, somewhere at number one. But also how far they would Exactly, down, right? yeah. So yeah. now maybe number four. They might not even get a Will Anderson, Jalen Carter in this draft class, which was kind of those two are in the tier of their own. Anyone after that from like, I, I guess that'd be, you know, th those two guys, then the rest of the sort of position players, non-quarterbacks in the class, there's probably a group of about 10 guys that I have similar grades on. So if you're at pick four versus pick 12 in this draft class, it really doesn't matter that much. Right. So then are they more willing than they go down to nine yeah. with Carolina? Yeah. Because they could... With the way that pant, with, with the way that owner is desperate to get a quarterback, yeah. what they might be willing to give up to move up, it'll be crazy. All right, let's let's dig in here, Mike, to the class a little bit in general. Generally speaking, sweet spot value wise for Giants at twenty five. I'm sure you haven't gotten many mm -hmm. twenty fifth pick in the draft questions this week so far. <laughs> What's the sweet spot in terms of value for where you're going to get the best player at twenty five in this year's class? That's a great question. I I I think the position groups that are deep are in my opinion, running back, tight end, cornerback. So I think the la that last one there, cornerback is probably the position that 
at pick 25 versus what you're usually going to get at pick 25 for the cornerback position. You might be getting the guy who in other drafts, say weaker cornerback drafts, could go pick 10 to 15. So okay. I think that's probably the sweet spot because it's so deep. I think I have like six first round grades in this cornerback class. It's just, there's a lot of talent. I want to ask you about receiver for a second because mm -hmm. if the Giants were to go corner, getting a, yeah. a very good player at 25, they don't go again until 57, mm -hmm. okay? At 57, how would you feel about them? Maybe they're taking the dip for a wide receiver. Somebody like Tillman, maybe, could he be there from Tennessee? Yeah, I think it has to be pick one or pick two, right? Wide receiver is a position that once you get to the back end of the third round, the track record of wide receivers hitting at that point and into day three is just very low. You there don't aren't find many Terry McLaurins out there. Exactly. And no. even Terry McLaurin is still a top 75. He went top of the third That's round, right. you know, back in the third round, back end of like outside of the top 75 picks, you don't find a lot. So uh, I do think that is, you know, the floor of where I'm willing to address wide receiver. And you're not going to get uh, this class doesn't have a ton of blue chippers at the wide receiver position, but it does have depth. It, you know, there are a lot of guys. And I do think that because maybe we don't see him go top 10, top 15 in this draft class just because of there's no real guy there. I think that could push sort of down boards a lot of wide receivers. And at pick 57, you could be getting a guy like a you know, Tank Dell uh, in this draft class that is a difference maker right away uh, at the wide receiver position in the second round. All right, let, let's dig into the wide receivers a little bit yeah. more then because you have Isaiah Hodgins, who's kind of the bigger possession type mm -hmm. of guy, right? You have Wondell Robinson coming off an ACL, yes, yeah. but – Five nine, I think you probably consider him primarily a slot only yeah. guy. Yeah. So we just said oh, we're gonna have Ben Solak on, mm. and we were chatting with him earlier today, and he was just like, you know, you want to find that six one guy that can separate and is a good route runner, can do a little bit of everything, <laughs> but that guy doesn't exist in this class. Well, yeah. if you're trying to find that guy, and you're Mike Renner, general manager, uh -huh. what players are you looking for that can kind of fit that? You know, I used the name before, that Terry McLaurin type of guy that can kind of just be the guy that's going to get open for you outside. It's separate. The show and even said Correct. That. Like, that's what he looks for is guys who get open. Like, the suddenness that it takes to create that separation at the NFL But level. also aren't 5'9". Yes, is, you know, like, yeah, because that's, that's Wandale is already kind of in right. that mold, but he's limited because of his, you know, catch radius. You're just not on the outside. The windows have to be, you have to give your quarterback a little bigger window. Uh, give him a little more margin for error because of how difficult those throws are to the sideline. And uh, when you are, you know, except 5'9", 5'10", like you just don't give that. So to me, there's not a lot of guys that fit that bill uh, in this draft class. Jordan Addison, probably the best in that mold. Does he get to of, 25? And that's the thing is uh, because of that, because everyone's kind of looking for that, he probably goes a little bit higher. Quentin Johnson, I think, can separate better than maybe he's getting – build as and I think he's a true outside type of X vertical route tree guy that can win there really good after the catch for a guy that side yes that as well and it's like but does he get to 25 uh, I, I do think you'll see probably a run where I would expect in like the mid teens you're probably gonna see those four guys that everyone's talking about as first rounders with Quinn Johnson Jordan Aston we just talked about Zay Flowers from Boston College Jackson Smith and Jigba from Ohio State I think you're gonna see a little bit of a run on that so it wouldn't surprise me with you know the Giants and their desperate need maybe to bump up a little to get into that mix of this wide receiver class. One quick follow-up, Paul. Yeah. You mentioned Njigba. Mm -hmm. Your colleague Sam Monson is on the I think he can play outside train. I had Daniel Jeremiah on yesterday. He goes, mm. I see him as a slot-only guy. Yeah. There seems to be differing in opinions on that because he was a slot-only guy at Ohio State uh -huh. when he played two years ago. This year, you really can't get anything out of what he did, right? So do you think he's a guy that can move outside? Is 40 time going to be big to determine that this week? How do you view Smith and Jigba? I think it will be big because the last time we saw him was this off sophomore year and I go back to Justin Jefferson uh, and his sophomore year versus his junior year, he was a completely different player we didn't get to see what he could you know his completely that, that third year like he was only 19 the last time we saw Jackson Smith and Jigba so there could be some more speed some more physical development left in the tank that we just didn't get to see because he was so hampered with the hamstring all year so if he comes here and goes you know four four five or something like that why can't he play outside then right? ex exactly then right. I think you are looking at a guy who can play on the outside but on tape as a sophomore, I was expecting high four fives, low four sixes, which is in this day and age, if you're running that, you better be six three, six four to play on the outside, and he's obviously not. All right, I want to ask you about two positions Joe Shane, the Giants GM, mentioned yeah. to us in his media avail yesterday. He said, look, he knows that they're thin on the defensive line, and it's harder and harder to find good defensive tackles these days because yeah. the crops coming out are not very fertile. Mm. All right, let's also talk about the inside linebacker spot, which is also not very deep. So 
I think they got to draft a defensive tackle if they can find somebody somewhere on that second or third day, early on mm-hmm. that third day. But I'm interested about the inside linebacker spot because Darian Beavers, who was taken out of Cincinnati in the sixth round last year and had a sensational camp before he hurt his knee, I wonder what you think his upside might be, and is his upside better than taking an inside linebacker in maybe the third round? That's a great question. I, I love I love Beavers coming out. I think I had him just outside the top 100 on the PFF board. I don't think he's ever going to be like a high-end coverage player, but he's a great between-the-tackles type of linebacker that you're not going to complain about in the running game, not going to complain about in-zone coverage. So. Um, I was a fan of him coming out, and I think he's probably penciling him pretty firmly in as a starter. But in this linebacker class, there's not a lot of great options. I mean, there's not a lot of guys I have better grades than I did Beavers coming out last year. It's just a weak class, and Mm -hmm. the problem also with it is the guys who are kind of the higher-end linebackers in this class, a lot of them are like sub-230. Which Trent it, Simpson, yes, like mm-hmm. or like right around that two thirty range, which they all look like safeties. Yes, like. <laughs> which which is kind of like getting away from. I think NFL is not trending towards smaller linebackers anymore. The smaller linebackers are playing like in the slot nowadays. So, so uh, I, I do think teaching guys to play between the tackles at the NFL level, a lot of teams have regretted that in recent years with draft uh, picks. So I, this linebacker class, I, I don't want to touch any of the guys in this linebacker class before like the third round not even sanders i know he's one of the guys that people have kind of talked about early if you really blitz a ton and obviously the giants do um if you really do that a lot he's that's the only scheme i could see him fitting into but he he's he was an edge that tra- played off ball this past year that really still looked like an edge like it's just he's getting that hype because he is a high-end athlete because he does rush the passer so well but watching him try to tackle in space watching him try to cover in space it's like He's very far away in that regard. All right, Paul, I mentioned the defensive tackles. Let me dig into that class a little bit here. What's the sweet spot if you're looking to add somebody as a kind of interior defensive line, maybe yeah. even a five technique type? Mm-hmm. And he's probably a rotation guy considering what the Giants have to start. And yeah. by the way, maybe a potential replacement for Leonard Williams, who uh-huh. is on the last year of his Yes. Uh, so DT class is fairly weak. I think I have, you know, obviously Jalen Carter at the top. But, like, after that, um, two other first-round grades – uh, Brian Brzee, the Clemson DT, um, and Kalisha Kansi, who's like a pure three technique. He's like 280 pounds. He's not going to fit a lot of schemes. So I, I don't think 25, that makes sense for uh, the Giants either way. This DT class is just after that, though. It gets even worse in my opinion. There's just not a lot of guys. You got uh, a couple nose tackles that I think, if they're there on the board for the Giants, could make sense. That can have a little versatility in uh, Siaki Ika from Baylor and Mozzie Smith from Michigan. But uh, you're really not getting pass rush out of a ton of guys in this DT class after the first round. What do you think of the Northwestern kid? I was a fan of his in Mobile, and he's kind of built the same yes. way as Kansi yeah. is, except I think he's even thicker than he is, to be yeah. honest with so you. Yeah, he's, so he's got a unique build in that he's 6'1", but has like a 6'10 wingspan. Right. Um, but he played edge at Northwestern. So he's a guy that really only played probably a couple hundred snaps inside in his career, which... It's a little different, you know, playing edge to inside is different, but then edge to inside against NFL caliber strength is a lot different. So he's a guy who out the gate, like you said, if if you're thinking two, year two, year three, he's a guy who could probably develop into that, but out the gate is probably not a guy you want to see in the field right away. You got time for one more for me? One more, Paul. Okay, hypothetical. Mm -hmm. Let's just say Saquon Barkley does not stick with the Giants. And they've got to go out and get themselves a running back who will fit what Brian Dable and Mike Kafka do in their scheme. Mm-hmm. How deep can they go before being forced to take someone who's going to be productive in that system? I think this class especially, it's, it, I said it was one of the strongest positions. I think you could probably get one in the third. Back into the third, there's still probably going to be a guy there that can be a bell cow type of running back. That's just how many there are in this draft who do you like in that spot Uh, i really like zach charbonnet from ucla Uh, now not sure if he makes it that far um he might not test well which might help but exactly like yeah he may only run like four five nine four six something in that range he's not a super high-end athlete but he's got great contact balance and he's you know carried a hefty workload there at ucla so that's a guy i really like in that mold if you are looking in the third round promote what you want to promote mike what do you got i got the draft guide that you, yeah. you so it up again. beautifully printed out there um there go. that's yeah, 100 players right now going to be 150 after the combine going to have all the combine 
uh, data analysis after as well, and then 250 by a draft day. So if you want to go check it out on PFF.com. That is John's version of the bench press. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, you're also doing the uh, PFF NFL podcast, correct? A couple yes. times a week? A couple times a week on the PFF NFL podcast. So make sure to check that as well. Awesome. Mike yeah. Ryder, thanks stuff. for joining thanks, us. Mike. We'll be back with Ben Solak right after this. We are back here on Big Blue Kickoff Live from the Combine in Indianapolis. It is, I believe, today's Wednesday, right? Day two here at the Combine. Indeed it is. And we had our player prospects, the first group talk this morning. Now we're joined here at the table by Ben Solak from The Ringer. You hear him on The Ringer NFL Show podcast yep. and various other things over at the TheRinger.com. Go check it out. Ben, how are you, man? It's good to see you. I'm good, dude. It's the NFL Combine, right? It's uh, it's right off the Super Bowl. It's a week shorter. Everybody's kind of already exhausted, but it's the Combine. It's the bomb. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and for someone like me that was in Mobile for the Senior Bowl, trust yeah, me, I'm 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 running on I'm running on fumes here, dude. Mm. It's, oh yeah, that's right. I saw, I saw you out there yeah, walking yeah. into the stadium. That's right. All right, so let's get started here. Before we touch on the draft stuff, I want to touch on Daniel Jones because I know okay. you as much as anyone like combing through the quarterback tape. I think you had a pretty good breakdown on Daniel at some point this yeah, year yeah. on Twitter, if I remember correctly. Just your take on well, we'll dig into it more, but let's just give me your thumbnail take on Daniel's season where he's at and, and how he played a quarterback yeah it was the best season of Jones career comfortably and it was a demonstration of how he should be a used as a dual threat player how he always should have been used more as a runner and how using a quarterback as a runner especially a guy of Jones's size adds a layer to the offense that improves it so tremendously right like Jones didn't need to have the crazy downfield throws and the impressive shots that he used to have to kind of pull this offense together. He was just kind of like a dink and dunk passer, but use him in the running game, get a good play caller, Mike Kafka, and you're you're set. So it was a wonderful season as proof of concept that a player like Jones can work. The price tag question is a separate question, right? Once you come over that bar of like, all right, we can function on offense with Jones. We can win a playoff game on offense with Jones. Now Real legit NFL starter, yeah. but then what? Yeah, it, it's the same question that the Raiders had with Derek Carr and the Titans had with Ryan Tannehill and the Vikings had, and then Washington had with Kirk Cousins. And when you're mm -hmm. a, when you're a starting caliber quarterback who isn't necessarily like very clearly in the Mahomes-Josh Allen tier, it's a hard conversation to figure out how the price tag should work, when the money should activate. And so Jones can clearly start in the NFL. If I were a team looking at quarterback free agency and Derek Carr and and Daniel Jones are both available, I'd be taking Jones, no question. But it's a question, it's a matter of what's the price tag going to look like. And that, that's the riddle to figure out over the next few weeks. All right, it's indisputed that the Giants need to improve their wide receiver core, yeah. which of course will have an impact on mm -hmm. Daniel Jones. What is your take on what they should do to best help him? Mm -hmm. Do they need to add a skyscraper? We know they need some speed and a deep threat. Yeah. But they could just as easily try to upgrade a smallish receiver as opposed to getting a different type of receiver. Yeah. What's your take? So what I start with is how uh, varied that Giants running game was, right? And how they would use multiple tight ends, they would use two backs, they would use all that motion and find creative ways to run the football. If you're going to do that, you want the receivers you put on the field to be willing to block. You want them to be guys who are functional as blockers. And that's when you look at some of the smaller guys in this class, right? This wide receiver class is, is pretty small. Yeah. Jordan Addison out of USC, Jack Smith and Jigbutt of Ohio State, Zay Flowers out of Boston College. And you go, all right, if we pick this guy and we put him out there, we need him to be a speed threat. We need him to be a downfield threat because we can't just stick him in the slot. We, we need that slot player in this Brian Dable, Mike Kafka offense. We need him to block. So now you start looking at some of the bigger players that are available. Quentin Johnson out of TCU, mm -hmm. Cedric Tillman uh, out of Tennessee. More, all right, does this body type make more sense for us? It does, but then you have to go back and look at the Isaiah Hodgins film and go, all right, if we think Hodgins is legit, which my boy Isaiah Hodgins, loved him for forever, very, very happy that he, <laughs> okay. he, he landed the way he did with the Giants. I think he's a legitimate player. I think he's a valuable receiver in the NFL. He's gonna, I think he's going to stay with New York. I think he's going to be useful. Uh, you already have your 6'3 guy. You already have your 6'4 guy. Do you want to go another the same way with Quentin Johnson? You want to build it with, with real, two really tall guys, not have the separation, always be living on contested catches? That's also tricky. This wide receiver class doesn't match up nicely with what the Giants need. And by the way, they already have a 5'9 guy and the Robinson in the slot. Yeah, too. exactly. Mm -hmm. And so it, what they want is just like a nice... 6'1 guy, <laughs> right? Like night, just like just average, like average above average height, average above average weight, a little bit of speed, just like a good all around dude. And that is not this class. He doesn't <laughs> exist in this class. It's all very polarizing right. players, which is really really tricky. And so when I look at early receivers, I wouldn't be surprised to see the Giants pass. I, I think that with with how well you saw Dable work around a rotating receiving core, with how easy it is to kind of find guys on the street who can work for you for a few weeks, I think I wouldn't be surprised to see them pass an early receiver and then later in the draft. 
draft, you start looking at day two guys. I brought up like Cedric Tillman out of yeah. Tennessee, who I like quite a bit. So do I. Yeah, he's a fun guy. You look at Michael Wilson out of Stanford. You look at Jaden Reed out of Michigan State. Some of the day two guys throw some darts and see if you can hit on one of those players. But at this point, like it, it the, the top of the class at wide receiver is the weakest we've seen in the last few years. You're just gonna mm -hmm. go chase and smoke. All right. Well, so how about this? Mm -hmm. Would you then consider tight end? in that spot. A guy like Dalton yeah. Kincaid, who mm -hmm. I love his tape, yeah. I think is phenomenal. But given how Mike Kafka and Dable have played in Buffalo and KC, mm -hmm. then I run a bunch of 12 or 13 personnel, right? right? There are 11 personnel guys. And we saw mm -hmm. the Giants do mostly 11 once they got towards the end of the year yeah. when yeah. they went away from the bigger personnel. So is that would that be a consideration for you? Or are you one of these don't pick a tight end in the first round guys? Absolutely, I would be comfortable taking a tight end early. Firstly, the class is great. It's awesome. Michael yes. Mayer out of North, uh, Notre Dame is excellent. Dalton Kincaid out of Utah, excellent. Luke Musgrave out of Oregon State, going to be one of the best athletes we've ever mm -hmm. seen. Mm -hmm. tight end like the top of the class is great before you even get to like the next year your darnell washington's and your brenton strangers and like there's there's so many dudes at tight end who can play this year the reason why i feel confident taking an early drafted tight end if i'm the giants is because there are some offensive coaches in the league who have a you know kind of a calcified strict view of football and they don't know how to have a tight end be the feature point of the passing game i could not be more confident that mike kafka coming from Kansas City Which, and Brian yeah. Dable just <laughs> with the experience that he has they would I, I'm so confident that if they decide to go the route of a primary target being tight end they know how to get it done yeah you know what buttons to press and yeah. so if you're if you widen that scope of pass catchers and you say we like what we've got from Daniel Ballinger a nice third round peg is a solid player for us but we can be a, like a 12 personnel team and have a Dalton Kincaid who's like 245 or Luke Musgrave who's like 240 250 and use them as a stretch player use them as a primary pass catcher use them like Mark Andrews use them like Travis Kelsey use them like Darren Waller use them like Dallas Goddard like that's a very functional approach to offense and so absolutely i would feel comfortable widening the scope out the tight end let me ask you about saquon barkley because yeah. brian dable never had a back like him in his previous stops in the nfl yeah. where he was offensive coordinator and by the way even in new england he was a position coach they never no, invested heavily in running back nothing either. like this no. nothing like this guy so how much more do you think they'll do with barkley if they're able to retain him mm -hmm. given what they've already shown you this year with barkley yeah so the the presence of, of Barkley and Jones as such big dudes in the backfield is where you start, right? Like, if you go back and you look at that Dable offense in, in Buffalo, one of the issues that they always had was they lacked size. They just weren't a big team, right? And they got right. Gabe Davis there and right. at the end, and they're trying to use Dawson Knox more. But, like, the backs, the backs were always small. You look at Mike Kafka and what, what the Chiefs always did, right? With with Ty your Tyreek Hills and your Clyde edwards Alaires and your Jarek McKinnons, even Kelsey, like, for the tight end position, they were small dudes. Jones and Barkley are big. And so that's when you see like those 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 games that they could close out in the fourth quarter running the football. They had size, they had power. And so Barkley is great because he's such a physical, imposing presence. Then when you get him out in the out, out, out into the concept, and you throw him the ball. Now it's a one-on-one -on -one situation, and that's where Barkley is so uniquely special, right? Because he's explosive and he's elusive and he's big. He's everything you can't tackle. He's a total nightmare. I think that you continue to use him as that that primary bell cow back. But the important thing that he brings to you is is the presence of size and physicality. It allows the Giants to transition from. Brian Dable, Mike Kafka, 11 personnel, throw the football, like, you know, the way that we want to be in the modern offense, so all of a sudden being ready for salting games away with a lead. And that's yeah. the thing that a lot of these spread offenses will lack, is that they'll be so good throwing the football, and then they'll get late down distance, or late in the game, that they're leading, right, and they want to salt the clock away. They don't have the body types to do it. The Giants do. And that's, I think, mm -hmm. really important as they transition from oh, this was a nice story. A little plucky Giants team make the playoffs, so that's cute. To like, no, we're going to be here every year. You got to be able to finish games and win games. They did that well this year because of a player like Barkley. It was a little surprising to us after Barkley had caught 91 passes as a rookie. Yeah. But they didn't even use him more as a part of the passing game this past season. Right. Did that surprise you at all? When when you, when they're living in that offense they were living in early in the season where they're under center a lot and they have multiple tight ends on the field, it's harder to get them back into the concept, mm -hmm. right? The other thing is running back targets are often a function of a quarterback checking down and a quarterback doesn't no check down as often when he has license to run and then the number one that's thing that's a great point then and, and i use that phrase specifically license to run because when you watch that giants film especially early you could tell that that kafka and dable were telling daniel jones the second you see daylight you are free to take it. We bless mm -hmm. you. Go for it. Like it, we might come back on the film on on Tuesday, and there was a the dig was open, 15 yards on the field. We, it's okay. If you see it, you, let's let's be honest. Daniel Jones was fumbling the ball a lot. Daniel Jones taking a lot of sacks before they arrived. So they told him, listen, if you see daylight, just go. Like avoid the negative play, avoid the sack, and that 
opened up the offense so much. It made Jones such a better player. But one of the things that that inherently exchanges, takes away, is running back targets. Because now Jones isn't sitting in the pocket going, all right, reading deep, reading intermediate, it's not open. I got to check it down. Now he's gone reading deep. Oh, I can run. And then he just right. leaves, right? And right. so that's going to take away from Barkley's targets. And that's why I bring up that you're not going to – like, I don't, I don't think – if Barkley's back in the Giants next year, I don't think he's defined by how much he catches the football. I really don't. Like, they're going to use him as a between-the-tackles runner. They're going to ask him to be dynamic there. They're asking him to be dynamic physically, and they're asking him to beat linebackers and, and bust off huge runs right between the tackles. That's what they need him to do because they don't need that check down back. That's not the way this offense is built. All right, so I'm going to – since you brought it back to Jones here, this will be my last one for you, Ben. Mm-hmm. If they do get better things around him, and I mean another receiver that can separate and get open, and I'll throw in maybe some better protection on the yep. interior of the offensive line too – do you see some of those shot plays down the field trying to make those, you know, 17-yard in cuts into some more traffic? Do you see more of those coming in this offense if they do add some more weapons and better protection? Or do you think they were happy with how the offense functioned last year, even though, let's be honest, they didn't produce more than 24 points in a game I don't think until mid-December, Paul, right. if yeah. memory right. serves. So how do you think that might look differently if they do give him better protection and better weapons? Absolutely, yeah. They'll, they'll try to access that area of the field more. This entire offense, with the presence of Jones and the, the ability of the quarterback to run the football, the danger of Barkley, it pulls the defense down in, right? And especially when you have shaky wide receiver rooms opposing defenses go, all right, we're just going to press these guys. Of course. We're, not, we're not scared of pressing Isaiah Hodgins and, 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 and Darius Slayton. Like, we think we can they get burned on it occasionally, but they feel good. Our corners match up nice against the receivers. So everybody's coming down towards the line of scrimmage. So to the extent to which you can punish that by running play action and getting behind that team, behind that defensive layer, you have to. They really couldn't access it last year. They, they, they 100% need to. So again, I go back to that, that theoretical receiver, 6'1", 200, you know, balanced guy, the sort of guy who's tough over the middle of the field. Terry right? McLaurin is what yeah. they need, let's be Terry, honest with Terry, you. Terry McLaurin, you're, you're Robert Woods, yeah. you're Alan Lazard, like it doesn't, like you're, even like Cooper Cup, like this is what like Cup's obviously incredible, but this is what he was built. He built That's his career lives. on early. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just we're gonna live between safeties and linebackers. We're gonna make tough ta- tough catches coming into contact. That's what we're going to do. And Woods is yeah. a free agent, by the way. Yeah. So like that sort of a, a, a mold, I think, makes a lot of sense. I would love to tell you that I fully believe in Smith and Jigba to do that because we did a lot of it at Ohio State. He's just a little small, and you start mm-hmm. to wonder about how that'll how that'll translate. So 100, percent they got to access that area of the field. But the other sort of guy who can get to that area of the field is a tight end. Yeah. And that's why like you look at your Michael Mayer, you look at your Don Kincaid, you look at your Luke Musgrave, and you see if you want to commit to that approach offensively. Final question for me. Yeah. What did you learn in the limited time that we saw from Wondell Robinson in his yeah. rookie season that maybe you didn't think of when he came out originally from college? I, I would say that like, it's not so much a learn thing so much as it's when you draft a player that small, you can figure out pretty quick, okay, this guy will do what it takes to survive at this size or he won't, right? Like I always remember Tutu Atwell with the Rams. And the second you saw Tutu play, you go, okay, well, this is not... Like he doesn't. He, he he's not comfortable with level physicality, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's not going to work. Tavon Austin right. was kind of the same exactly. way too. Right. Way. Wandale went out and played, and you go, okay, this guy will do it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? This guy will take the hits. This guy will do the, the dirty stuff. Like he knows how to protect himself. From Nebraska, yeah. when he was doing some running back right. stuff. But that's the thing is, like, like you'll see it in college, and you'll get to the NFL, and it's just it, it's a different speed, it's a different physicality. Always when you draft those small guys, that's the concern. Is they're just not going to be functional. Wandale was 100 percent above the bar, and that's just like a sigh of relief. That's okay. Your scouting mm-hmm. department did a great job of figuring out the character of this guy, figuring out how much he likes ball. He's going to do it. Now it becomes, how, how do we use this guy game, right? Now, early on, it's like gadget stuff, Kentucky stuff. Find a way to get the ball in his hands. Can he develop into being more of a player? Because your speed threat ideally is taller and, and, and longer and has a bigger catch radius. Like, Wandale's always going to be a bit of like a gadget guy, designed to touch guy. So it's on Brian Dable and Mike Kafka to, to cash in on. You guys use a top, what, 45 pick on him, right? He was, he was a four, yeah. top 40, 50. You have to design targets for that dude you have to justify that investment so it's on the office coaching staff now say all right this guy's great with the ball in his hands great athlete he's tough he'll do what we we ask him to do we got to get the ball in his hands all right i'm going to give you one more big picture we haven't asked anyone a big picture giants question yet is this going to be you think the escalator continually up you Mm -hmm. think maybe there could be a little bump here maybe a small step back then up again what do you see as a a trajectory for this team who Mm -hmm. really got their record last year by winning a lot of close games and some things went right for them Late in games, look to the Ravens game, the Titans game early in the year, right? They're really tight. They made plays at the end. Do you think, again, this is kind of like the straight line graph? You think it could be a little bounce back this year and then step up? How do you just see the long-term trajectory yeah. of, of this group together? The escalator does not exist in the NFL. I know. That's, I, that's I, why I asked the question. That's, yeah, exactly. That's the most <laughs> important thing, right? Like, the Chiefs with Patrick Mahomes have not been an escalator. The Brady 
Patriots were about as close to an escalator as we got, and even then they weren't an escalator, right? It is development is not linear. That's what we always development is not 100%. linear. And so I very much think the Giants could be a better team than they were last year because I think their coaching staff is incredible. They kept both their coordinators. You have a, right. a think about the amount of young guys that you saw because of injury this year at wide receiver, at corner. Mm-hmm. Like think about Kayvon getting to be fully healthy and have a year in an NFL room. Think about like all the linebackers they got to see. Like, there's just so much data that you have. Evan Neal, yeah. you're better. Right, exactly. Yeah. That you can. I think it would be a better team. Does that mean they'll have a better record? Not necessarily. No, that's, a, that's a great point. I wish it oh, did. No. My job would be so much easier if like the good teams <laughs> always had the good records and the bad teams. But that's not the way this league works, well, man. We'd all like that. <laughs> it would be it would be very convenient for me, but that's not the case. So I think the Giants would be better. I think keeping the coordinators was huge. The It, it boils back to the first question you asked me. I'm. They're going to try to keep Jones. What price tag is it going to be at? Franchise tag or otherwise? And was last year a pumpkin, a Cinderella year, and he's going to turn back into a pumpkin, or was it, you know, something that that, that Brian Dable can have, you know, a year over year? If so, like Giants should reasonably expect to be fighting for the playoffs again next season. And like, if they have a good draft, they'll be that team. They were so under talented. They were so successful last year. Coaching staff, like Brian Dable, coach of the year by a mile for the way that they performed. But development's not linear. It's never that easy. Yeah. Promote anything you want to promote, Ben. Ringer NFL show. Ringer NFL draft show. Ringer. NFL, Ben. <laughs> Ringer, Ben, good stuff, brother. Appreciate good it. Benjamin Appreciate Solak will be back with Connor Rogers talking some draft with us right after this. All right, we're back here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. We thank Ben Solak for joining us. Great spot talking some Daniel Jones. And now we're joined by Connor Rogers, who covers the NFL and the draft for SNY, for NBC Sports, you name it. Connor, good to see you again, man. How are you? Absolutely, guys. I'm great. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, we just mentioned those before we came on that you've been working on kind of what the Giants are keeping an eye on and focusing on for the draft this week. Spill the beans. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, the obvious is wide receiver. Everybody knows that. But the big domino that everyone's trying to figure out is which guy falls and which guy do they like in that spot? Is it going to be a Jordan Addison that has a lot of polish? He's won the Balikinoff. He can win on all three levels. Jackson Smith and Jigba. There's a Quentin Johnson fall, and they want that true X, six foot four, 210 plus pound kind of guy. But then you look outside of that. The wide receiver is obvious. I've heard D line. You wonder what the range is for that. It's been Jalen Carter day for all the wrong reasons around here. But how about Brian Brzee? If he falls down, didn't have the year he hoped for, but I think still is a fringe first rounder. Uh, And then I know they've been doing work on corners, too. And it doesn't really surprise you when you look at their roster right now, how Wink Martindale prioritizes corners for a defense. He asks a lot of the corners of their defense. And this is a great corner class, guys. The guys that are going to go in the top 20, you know the household names. Christian Gonzalez, Devin Witherspoon. uh, You look at Joey Porter Jr. But there's a lot of good guys outside of that, whether it's Keely Ringo, Cam Smith, Deontay Banks from Maryland. So the Giants are actually in a sweet spot to still capitalize on a corner class as well. Let me ask you about the, uh, the general draft before we get back to Giant stuff. In your mind, where's the line of delineation after the the top level of guys? Because we've heard a lot of people say to us, the whole maybe bottom half of that first round is almost like early second round value. And then does the second round in your mind bleed into the third round? It's a really good question because you look at it, you have your blue chip talent. It's going to be a little bit top heavy this year. You probably have 13 players that you separate from the pack. And then I look at 20 to 45 being the same level of talent of a player, which makes it interesting for the Giants. 20 to 45. Yeah, the Giants pick 57 with the second pick. So it makes you wonder, is this a year? And I know they've been patient wisely. I think they've had a great start to this rebuild. They made the playoffs. It's crazy to say Mm -hmm. that. Are they aggressive at some point? Do you go up from 57? Do you go back from 25, right? Do you go back and go, hey, we'll pick a couple times in that window. So I think there's day two value across the board. And I actually, this is the thing with the Giants. Everybody talks wide receiver at 25 and and along the lines of that. I like the depth in the day two group of this wide receiver that I think you actually wait a little bit and you try to get a blue chip kind of talent that maybe falls to 25 on the defensive side of the ball. So it puts puts Joe Shane in a really interesting scenario. To get that receiver you're talking about, do you have to move up? from 57 to go earlier in the second round it depends what you're looking for the speed guys are going to go right you you know that Jalen Hyatt's going to come here and run in the four threes he's going to go even Tyler Scott from Cincinnati another speedster he's going to run well but at 57 you have a Cedric Tillman from Tennessee who I think the Giants need size at wide receiver as well I like him I don't know if he gets that far I don't know if you need a six four guy but you definitely can't have another five nine exactly and that's what this class is littered with when you go say Flowers Tank, Tank Dell Josh Downs they're good players it, how many small wide receivers can you constantly litter with the field? That's why I go back to a guy like Tillman, right, who's definitely on the bigger end. You don't need a guy that large. Uh, but he, I think his range is going to be round three, depending on what he runs here. Oh, wow. 
How about the Penn State wide receiver, Parker Washington? Is he kind of in that zone for you, too? And he's kind of that mid-sized guy as well. Interesting player, right? When you have a slot that's 5'10", 5'11", but weighs about 212. He's, right. a, he's a thicker slot. He's got that thicker build. I think back to Amari Rogers a couple years ago, the only guy I've seen like that. Um, and I think he's more round three to round four. It's just a question of if you're not a guy in the slot that doesn't run four threes, you're a reliable possession player. We think we can find that player later on. We think in rounds three to six, we can find that player. We don't need to prioritize that player. So I like him as a possession player, but I think he's looking more at the top of day three. Interesting. Right, let's ask about inside linebacker. How do you feel about the similar kind of question for the Giants at that spot? Yeah, it's another class that I feel like you can wait. I don't know if we have a first rounder this year. I like Trenton Simpson. He's going to run well. He's 240. He's small, man. And, and yeah. exactly. He's not a middle linebacker. He needs to be playing outside. And it's interesting how Clemson used him two years ago. Played a lot of outside backer, looked more comfortable this year. They stick him right in the middle. I don't think that was a great move all the time. And he still played well, but he didn't play great. Jack Campbell, if you want that six foot four, mm -hmm. 250 old school thumping Mike backer, that's a guy on day two that I would prioritize because there's not a lot of Jack Campbells anymore. He's always in the right place. He's got the big arms to disrupt passing lanes. He could do everything. He's got instincts and coverage. So it's a matter, there's a million six one, 225 pound, pound linebackers in this class that can run. Go right. get me the guy that's six four, six five, <laughs> can thump, can be brash in the middle of the field, yeah. and and is never out of place. Never, there's no bad Jack Campbell. Team. Gary reasons. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's what you're looking for, right? Yeah. All right. You mentioned Brian Brzee before. Uh, yeah. We and Mike Renner on talking about some day two defensive tackles. He's a guy that I think you could sell as a first round pick sure. at DT, right? I watched his tape this year. Very unimpressed. I agree. Everyone has told me go watch the 2021 tape. I've not had a chance to do that yet. If you go back and watch that, and look, for the people that don't know, he had a rough 2022. His sister yes. died of cancer. Uh, he dealt with injuries the whole year. He even said today, I did not play well earlier in the year. I kind of came on the last yep. two or three games. So how do you see Brzee? Does the 2021 tape tell a different story? And could you be potentially getting a top 10 caliber player in the 20s if you roll the dice on a guy like that? You could. Now, I'll say this with 2021 flashes. I, I don't think it's a dominant tape week in and week out. I think there's flashes when you look at a guy 305 pounds that feet like that to move to be able to shoot gaps to be able to win with power and i think you did see quickness this year but i don't think you sure. saw the power though that you saw no i actually right. to go back to that this year he had a matchup against darnell Wright in the bowl game the big hulking tackle from tennessee and darnell Wright put him on the ground quite a few times and that's mm. concerning to me because i like i like Wright's stock i still think he's a round two tackle he's so not this I, premier I round one tackle and brzee should be at least stalemating a lot of those matchups, winning some of those matchups. So you're betting on talent. You're betting on a five-star recruit profile that was the number one recruit in his class. Great worker. Everybody loves him. There are flashes of premium talent. But I don't know if that's a round one player. All right. We got to go to the running back spot now because just in case. Yeah, just in case. Saquon Barkley does not return to the Giants. I just asked this of our last guest. Where do you think they could find a guy who will do the kinds of things that would fit into the Giants scheme? Yeah, that's a good question because that's a lot on the plate, right? You need to be able, you need to be able to catch the ball. Uh, you need to be able to trustworthy in pass protection, and you love the idea of the home run every now and then, of course. Now, let's get B. John Robinson out of the way. Yes. That's not happening. I think Jameer Gibbs out of the way. That's not happening. How about Zach Charbonnet from UCLA on day two? You're yeah, the second guy that's mentioned. In yes. Oh, I love, I love, I love Charbonnet. Time. Charbonnet's got some of that. This is maybe hyperbole, but when you watch Matt Forte back in the day, a bigger back, mm. a filled out back, a physical back, he can run downhill, he can block, he can catch. It, it's so funny when I watched Charbonnet last summer to get ready for the draft this year, I go, what is this guy doing in the pack? Well, he transferred from Michigan. He looks like a Big Ten running back okay. playing in the pack, out of sorts, bigger than everybody, more physical, three downs. That's the number one guy, I think, for the Giants style wow. of offense. Good stuff. Christine, our producer, is very excited. She's a UCLA yes, person over there. very much so. Team that Charbonnet. Yeah, <laughs> that definitely got her attention. He forced us to draft Darnay Holmes a few years ago. Yes, okay. I, I loved Darnay in the slot that year, and he's a great dude. I tell you what, though, this is a deep running back class. Like, it is. You know, Tajay Spears. I think he's going to blow up the agility Jones sure. this week if he has a chance to do it. I mean, I think you can probably find if you don't need a bell cow, and I'm not sure if you do based on what Mike Kafka and Brian Dable have done elsewhere. 
if you're looking for a part-time back, I think round four, you're yeah. fine. You'll be okay. And, and that's where Ty J is sitting. He's my RB5 in this class, and I still think he's probably going in the fourth round because of size. Really? You think he's going to go at four, huh? Mid rounds three to four is what okay. I continu continuously hear. I thought he looked great in Mobile, Alabama. Phenomenal. I, I think he's got that foot quickness. He's got speed. He's handled a heavy workload. He had over 200 carries last year in massive production, so he's taking mm -hmm. hits. You don't worry about the injuries with him. Uh, you want to get back to maybe a more value player, though. How about B. John Robinson's backup and Roshan Johnson? Johnson. Big dude. He's a big dude, 6'2", 220. Another guy, he had an injury during Senior Bowl week, but caught the ball, pass protect. You go back and in a vacuum, watch him when they give Bijan a rest. This guy, if he was on any other program, would be a top back in the country. He's just behind the best running back we've seen since Saquon Barkley. All right, let's say, Paul, do you mind if we go one more here? I got one more for no, him, too, so go ahead. No, you go first. Go ahead. All right, a little bit off the board. Who is the highest-ranked player that you have going into this draft that was not invited to the Combine? That should have been a real sleeper and might have made some uh, waves had he been here. Yeah, two quick ones for you. Carl Brooks, uh, the big pass right. rusher. Who, Bowling Green, right? Yeah, an yeah. interesting player because he's, he's kind of built like an edge. He plays inside. Should have been at the combine. I mean, when you're a senior bowl player, you had a ton of production. Had numbers. You, yeah. you had numbers. You could rush the passer. 300 I think pound been, edge guy, right? And I think he would have been a good tester at that size. Yeah. You put him in the D-line group. And then how about Marte Mapu, the the, uh, the linebacker from SAC, from Sacramento State? I mean, interesting player, right? He has a great season. They have a great season. They win a million games. He makes plays off the ball. He can blitz. He can cover. He can run and chase. He goes to the NFL PA Bowl is the player there. Gets the call up to the Senior Bowl, and everybody goes, oh, good for him, he got the call up. Right. No, he was one of the best players on the field at the Senior Bowl during practices. I mean, I was 10 feet away from him on the field, and you hear the pads pop when this guy comes downfield. So he should have been at this event, and whoever okay. takes him on day three will get an absolute steal, at least on special teams in the beginning, and then a sub-package cool. role. We briefly mentioned tight ends with, with Ben on the last interview. If they get to the point where they decide, much like we've talked about, we don't have a wide receiver that fits the profile we want in round one, assuming Jordan Addison doesn't get there, right? And maybe Smith and Jigba we see as a slot-only guy, which I think some people do. You can tell me if you, if you disagree. Does it, a tight end make sense there if you can find the guy with the right catching profile? So to me, I would be looking more at the Dalton Kincaid yep. types than the Michael Mayer types. I'm curious to see how Laporta from Iowa tests here. Sure. They think if he runs well, his route running in his hands, then you start thinking, all right, maybe this guy can give you something as a receiver. When do you start considering that receiving tight end if maybe you decide this wide receiver class is not for me? I think day two for me. And I understand mm -hmm. the love of this class for round one tight ends. I'm a big Michael Mayer guy. I think he's yeah. the best tight end we've so seen in a while. I love him. He's a top 15 player for me in the draft. Guy, block, receive, he everything. could do anything. Yep. He could yep. play off the line of scrimmage. He could play on the line of scrimmage. But that's a rich price to pay for a tight end. Luke Musgrave, going to go round one. That's not for me in round one. He can run really well, but he's been hurt. Kincaid, like you said, pass catcher only. You get into day two. How about Tucker Kraft from South Dakota State, mm -hmm. which is a school that produced Dallas Goddard, who obviously mm -hmm. we know really well. He can run and catch. I think he can survive on the line of scrimmage. I like Laporta. Laporta was used in a lot of different ways at Iowa and an offense that just could not get it together. So day two is the sweet spot. This is a tight end class that I would say is eight to nine people deep. It's going to be curious how Darnell Washington goes. I think it's going to be round one as well. I would wait till day two uh, and be able to capitalize on value. It's just not a position you want to reach on in round one very often when you have other needs. Right. Darnell Washington, by the way, fans that don't know about a 285-pound yeah. offensive tackle that happens to play the tight end yeah. position. And can run and catch somehow. Yes, and we'll see how he tests this week. Connor, this was great, man. Yes. Uh, let's Thank catch you. up. Thank and, you, guys. And we'll do something later in the draft process again Absolutely. as we get closer. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll be back to wrap up the show right here in Indy on our day two of Combine coverage. We'll be right back after this. All right, we're back here on Big Blue Kickoff Live from the NFL Combine in Indianapolis. John Schmelk, Paul Dettino, wrapping things up for you. We got a lot of other stuff coming your way next couple of days. Make sure you stay tuned. A lot of great guests. Uh, and, of course, Giant Huddle Podcast as well. So make sure you go check those out as well. So, Paul, we just want, before we said goodbye today, we wanted to kind of talk about what we saw this morning with defensive linemen and linebackers at the podium, and a couple guys jumped out to you. Yeah, you know, I I'm just going to go off the board a little bit and tell you about the guy who, to me, from his personality, just stole the podium for the day, and that's Nolan Smith, the linebacker out of Georgia. Uh, a guy who was incredibly emotional, incredibly honest, uh, showed such terrific character. But what really got to me, John, and I think everybody who was around his podium at the time could not help but walk away with the same impression, was how he opened up about uh, Devin Wallach, the offensive lineman who was killed in a car accident. Um, after and then playing... that's the accident, by the way, that's connected to the Jalen Carter situation. Yes. Uh, he had played three years. He wore number 77. And... 
you know, when he started to talk about him, he said, look, I haven't talked about this before. And he just started welling up in front of everybody and basically was weeping and, and could not contain himself as he talked about his teammate. It's unfair this had to happen to him. He dreamt about being here. He played three years for us. We do everything for number 77. We think about him all the time. It was, it was hard to watch, but at the same time, the honesty, the emotion, and the character, you could not help but love this kid as a human being. And that's what the coaches and the GMs talk about when they say these personal interviews at the Combine are important. You find out a lot about a guy's soul and about what's inside here, not just what's inside the helmet and the shoulder pads, but what's inside his chest. And I can't say enough about this young man. And Nolan Smith could be end of round one, early round two, one of those 240-pound speed, linebacker, right. edge rusher, hybrid type guys. Yes. Missed most of the year with a pec injury this year. Very mm -hmm. talented, though. Uh, just want a couple of themes from today, Paul. Linebacker spoke. A lot of linebackers that look like safeties. Yes. That are like 6'1", 220-something pounds. They need some prime rib dinners uh, yeah, shoved but, down I mean, your throats. He, he, they might... Sure, but they're just not big framed. No. Like you a guy like Dayon Henley, who I thought was really impressive at the podium, just a smaller guy. Trent Simpson, another guy that's just smaller. Demarion Overshone, very slender guy. Just not mm -hmm. a lot of big guys. You know, I thought Jack Campbell was a little bit of a bigger frame. I think yes. he kind of looks like he could grow into a 250-pound linebacker. Could. Uh, Noah Sewell, a thicker linebacker, too. I think if you're looking for, like, yeah. that bigger, older-school linebacker, Penny those Sewell's are the brother, guys. The Correct. Those are the guys you look at. A um, couple other things that jumped out to me, I thought Will Anderson looked the part of a number one type draft yeah. pick on the edge. <laughs> uh, B.J. Ojolari, Aziz's brother, spoke today. I mm -hmm. thought he was very good. Um, different personality than his brother, actually. If you just hear him talk, like you wouldn't think they were related, just hearing okay. the two of them talk, in my I did opinion. not talk to him. But he, real smart guy. He said he was – one thing that's interesting, he said, I'm more of a finesse player than B.J. He's more of a – bulldozer i am more of a finesse guy with oh. speed that's what bj said about him and his i wonder what Aziz which i thought was say about that <laughs> yes i so do i um so that was kind of my takeaway from the groups uh i thought lucas van ness looked like an nfl player yes he's he's got big the build. frame dude he's got absolutely the build. um I i'll give you the guy who looked like sure, an ice house for me and and I I did not watch him or scout him in any way texas defensive tackle keandre colburn this dude, let me tell you something. Just looking at him, you feel like you've been squashed into a pancake. He is so stout, so wide, so thick. It, it, it struck me. It separated him from every other player that I saw at the podium during the entire course of the day. Yeah, Tyree Wilson, really long, by the way. Cynthia uh, Cynthia Freeland, who we're going to have on later on the weekend at Giants Huddle, we talked mm -hmm. to her about that, just huge wingspan. Uh, Will McDonald is one of those you know slender edge rusher types like Nolan Smith. We had him at the Senior Bowl. I think he's going to be a really good player. But again, he's, he said his playing weight last year was between 235 and 240. Yeah. As an edge rusher. He said he, he hopes to get to 250. He's working on it. Um, I was impressed by Tommy Adeboare from Northwestern. I thought he just seems like a really smart guy. Again, he's short, he's stout, but he's got long arms. I think he's a guy that Could can be really it. disruptive at some point. Klaja Kansi, another one of those similarly build, undersized defensive tackles, is, uh, is somebody that we 280 saw. 280 for Kansi. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and um, Adeboare is, is, is literally about the same exact size. So those are kind of the guys that, that jumped out to me, Paul. And tomorrow we're going to have the DBs, which mm -hmm. will be a big day. We'll get corners and safeties. So we'll make sure we get the lowdown on those guys for the fans The tomorrow. only other thought I would say today, John, is that most of the guys, and certainly I guess 90-something percent of the guys that I did talk to, and I know you and I made similar rounds, but also at different players that we talked to At different well, times, yes. At different times. I'm very impressed with their, their acumen, their ability to uh, to handle the media. I agree with that. It, it, this might be the best first full day session of media availabilities that I've ever seen the players have as a whole in general. Either they're getting some great coaching or these guys are just uh, developing their maturity and their personalities a lot better in college than some of the folks in years past. And they just come off as good kids. They do. To be do. quite honest with you. They, they do. all do. I'll throw a Diane Henley, too, by the way. Really small linebacker. I'm not sure he's going to fit 
what necessarily the Giants want. He says his playing weight is between 230 and 235, mm -hmm. but he was great in coverage at the Senior Bowl. And the way he talked about the importance of film study, he just seems yes. like a really smart kid. Yes. I, enjoy, he, I enjoyed that. He has some Fred Warner vibes to me with the way he plays. Remember, Warner was a guy that it, he was BYU Warner or was he? I don't remember. Utah. I think he might, might have been Utah. He has that kind of those vibes to me. So just some things that kind of anyway. stuck out. Anyway, tomorrow, I don't have my schedule here, but tomorrow we got a big show coming up here just to kind of give us a little preview. Uh, we're going to have Sam Monson from Pro Football Focus. I'll make sure I'm pulling him, debate Eli Manning to the Hall of Fame. That'll be fun. Mm, that's not a debate. It's a one-handed slam. And, and we're also not going to do that. I'm just teasing Paul. Okay. Uh, Jordan Reed from ESPN will be joining us. Charles Davis from NFL Network will be joining us. And uh, Art Stableton as well, who... You know, we'll continue to talk the giant angle with free agency. We'll be on the show tomorrow. And make sure you check out uh, Charlie Weiss on the Giants Huddle Podcast. That should be going up uh, in a couple of days. Thanks for being with us, everybody. For Paul Dottino, I'm John Schmuck. We'll see you next time on Big Blue Kickoff Live.